Lisa, tell me about what this beautiful object is. Okay. Well, today we're looking at the A5L spacesuit, which I know you're very familiar with. I'm familiar with the A7L, so this is the this is two series earlier than right. That. So NASA had a competition to build spacesuits to go to the moon. Yeah. Uh, there were several versions, starting with one. Mm -hmm. uh, five was the first suit where they integrated the um, some of the features that they really wanted to move on to the A7L. So that was a lot of the arm. Uh, leg and wrist joints for mobility. Uh, at some point they moved the zipper to the back because they realized the front zipper, which we have in the one L suit mm -hmm. um, in our collection would, would cause too many problems under pressure. There was oh. no way when it was crunched up when people were wearing it to hold to hold that pressure. So oh, interesting. Um, they, they moved it to the back, which we're all familiar with. Yeah. Um, but this was really the suit that set the stage to go to that next stage. Like this was just you know, we are going to do it. We can prove it. This is what, you know, the internal restraint system is going to look like. These yeah. are the mobility joints. Um, it was flexible under pressure in a soft environment. They could get in and out of it themselves, which was really important. Um, and can spend long hours in a soft garment. Well, and I think people don't really realize that we, we all know the white Apollo spacesuit. But this is under every one of those. A right. structure very similar to this. So the convolutes on the shoulders, the cage around the shoulders, the convolutes for the elbow, the bearings on the wrists. Correct. The, all the tightening. I mean, each of these is systems for adjusting the suit, right? So right. even this would have actually the outer covering on it. This is just the inner layer. Yeah. Yes, they, they oh, went through. Oh, I didn't get that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they went through well, I thought they finally like discovered color. Okay. <laughs> they no, went through different not. versions. So. Um, like you've experienced, I mean, there's a launch and re-entry suit that you can wear for a purpose and then something to do EVA, yeah. extravehicular activity. I'm supposed to spell that out because a lot of people don't know what EVA is. <laughs> it's good to um, But so they started with, uh, you know, trying different pieces. Are we going to have a vest over this and legs? Are we going to, you know, what is that uh, going to look like? But then they decided that everything needed to be really integrated together. Yeah. It had to work together and just stay together and they weren't going to separate the inner restraint and comfort layer and bladder from that uh, micrometeor garment, which we know of as the beta cloth on the outside, which is white. Now, Katie, you're always talking about the fact that it's hard to make spacesuits for all sorts of different sizes of humans. Well, this one is looking good for me. This I mean, one looks really I mean, don't you good think? for you. Like, I'm not touching, but <laughs> I mean, no, you know, if we slanted this a little bit, you know. I think it's pretty exact for you, Katie. Well, this is a prototype. Um, and as, as Katie has told me, like they made it for like 5% to 90% male, male figures. So right. uh, humans um, at that point. So that's what the goal would have been for, for this program. Um, not the programs we have today, um, thankfully. So um, yeah, it looks a little small. Uh, the materials do under deterioration. Uh, sort of t uh, get very tight. The rubber is not as flexible or expandable. I was going to say, this is old, old natural rubber, And, and right? that's in a good... That configuration is beautiful. Oh, it smells like it smells like the. Does it? Yes. It smells like deteriorating rubber. Oh. Well, well, just it has that. I don't it know. It has that smell of military equipment of, that I've exactly. worked with for with exactly. props. Exactly. Like a little. It smells like a type of polychlorine um, coming off that mm -hmm. neoprene, but mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah. It's a little sweet. I remember originally. Oh yeah, there you go. That's yeah, totally yeah. from the neoprene. I'm originally <laughs> a polymer scientist, plastics chemist. So you know the iterations that rubber has gone through since then to right. be able to, you know, make it really you know flexible and stay that way for a long time. And, and this only had a working life of up to six months at this point. The rubbers they really? were using. Um, BF Goodrich helped with the original bladders and different aspects to the suit. Uh, but then by Apollo 14, they added that antioxidant when they were they knew they were going to do more. Uh, outside the spacecraft lunar excursion. Right. So they needed the spacesuit to last more days right. um, up in space. So we do have our, the suits from that time period are a little bit in better condition, but uh, these earlier ones were not made to last. No they space materials up. were made to last. Yeah. So this is right. my whole challenge in life is, <laughs> you know, they are made for the harshest and most unbelievable conditions and worked, but we can't uh, seem to stop them from deteriorating on Earth. So if you had something like part of the convolute was rotting away. Would you guys go to uh, fix that or fill that or just stop it from continuing? Do you mean in a conservation sense? Yeah. yeah um, most of the pre work we do is preventive. Yeah. So that's in where we control the environment, even humans from handling the suits. 
Uh, we have them on these supportive mannequins we've designed to keep the shape as best we can. And the mannequins um, are archival, so they don't off-gas anything. Notches, right, so. and, and they really replicate. We've done a lot of research to replicate where the pressure points of the person wearing the suit would bend to support to support the suit correctly. Oh. They're not made for gravity, so even having something stand. Um, and I should have added that this was also one of the first um, designs where they knew they'd be walking in a suit, walking on a surface. Oh, so very wow. different. Right. Right. Yeah. I wondered in terms of sizing, like, you know, nowadays we're really making every effort to try to make suits that fit a whole range of people. Yeah. Because that's who we're going to have walking on the moon again. Right. And, you know, you don't want to forget the lessons from the past. And I think that suits like this can help us remember, perhaps. I, I wondered things like this where I see the blue string going back and forth. Was that for sizing? Yeah, those are some sizing, people taller, some shorter sizing, kind of thing? Uh, sizing areas. They also help to keep the ballooning effect. Uh, so under pressure, there was still this slight um, ballooning mm -hmm. feeling, and they needed to make sure part, parts did not. Also, uh, walking in a suit, uh, the rotation of your thighs is very odd. And um, I was actually reading up on this this morning because I thought, <laughs> I'm going to get a weird question about this. But the mobility for this suit had to had to be in a sense where, you know, taking those steps, you were not you were ex not having to exaggerate your movement, and then it would go back. But you were rotating your hips and legs together. And would keep so this sort of, so it's, it's just like this. Yeah, but they, they, remember they do this like bunny hop? Yeah. Because oh, they, right, you yeah. can't really just walk straight. Right, um, right. It, it's like when you used to use those old treadmills and they would force your hips in one direction instead of having something where you could just walk, mm -hmm. the Nordic track or something. Yeah. It, it reminded me of that where they're forcing your hips into a position where you're walking and it's not natural. I well, had not thought of that as a, as a, a consequence of the pressure. And now some of the research is into, well, I mean, how could a spacesuit not just protect you and let you walk like you would on Earth, but why not use the fact that you're going to have that lack of gravity and, and actually have it help you? Right. Be even more efficient on yeah. the moon. And that same mechanism actually leads to support for like people who have drop foot or can't can't use their feet, you know, which happens oh, when you're older. Fascinating. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. When you talked about the suit ballooning and I was fascinated to see this. I mean, I think that that is what that is for. Like when let, let's say you lose pressure on the cabin. Right. Then that's when your suit is actually going to inflate yeah. bigger. And suddenly you could be like the Pillsbury dough person and, and be able, you need to be able to re reach controls and things like that. And so in yeah, the Soyuz, our circle for, yeah. suits have that. And as soon as something happens, you yank that thing. In fact, it is it is really tight when you launch, really strapped in. I love that this is a feature that has been on every suit ever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like it's the not the whole strap down. Tie yeah, down. That, that one one yeah. orientation. And that's when the zipper would have been all crunched up underneath you and not oh, and that's comfortable why it's hard and not working oh. because if it had not functioned to pressurize, yeah. they did add a second zipper to these later suits too. That is a pressure seal zipper over the regular zipper to the outside of the the suit. Okay. Um, the other thing I I was reading up on was they needed this to go up and down that ladder. Oh, onto the surface. Right, so they were right. with the that big steps. Thought, right. Yeah. Right. With the really big steps. So I hadn't thought about oh, that. Oh, so they either. had to be able to flex enough. Yeah. Wow. Is this the David Clark company? So this is ILC. ILC. Um, okay. This is the one that won the competition for to move into the A7L. But David Clark did contribute to many of the versions up to this. Um, they still did the life support system and it was still a sort of um, cooperation between the. And, and this is efforts. an underwear company. Yeah, yeah, yeah women's latex, underwear company. right? Well, <laughs> that's the A5L. It was Latex Corporation back then. Oh, interesting. Um, which is why they the um, seamstresses could sew on these flexible rubberized fabrics because they had that experience Thanks. with bras and girdles. Uh, where you and, know, and support and wanting to sort yeah, of you know make sure that things. In fact, I, I gave an award to the, the folks who happened to be women at the David Clark Company for designing the first ACES suit, that orange suit, the pumpkin suits, we call them for shuttle, um, that were designed more for women that had, you know, a little more room down here and a little more room up here. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, I Am I right? It looks like it's in spectacular shape for a 55-year-old prototype. This one is in good shape. We have a couple A5Ls in the collection, and I don't think this has been out of storage as much, um, which always helps because it's in dark and we keep a very tight climate control. Yeah. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, we try to keep the relative humidity at 30%. Uh, there's a lot of research about polymers off-grassing 
and releasing plasticizers after 30% relative humidity. Interesting. Um, mm. And when we started our projects with all the research we've done here, um, we always got asked by people in the space industry why we are not keeping them in nitrogen or argon or any of these inert um, gases that would protect them. But the problem is the oxidation isn't as great as the other and deterioration it's undergoing. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. rubber is only a part of this complicated engineering model. Um, and so we have to think about the corrosion on the aluminum, which we have seen. Oh. Um, other metals on the surfaces, uh, the other soft materials that you probably are familiar with, the neoprenes. Um, also their, their rubber was a latex neoprene blend. It was the only one that was uh, the, that I'm familiar with mm -hmm. at this time period that was a natural and synthetic together, which is not good. Not the good. So uh, suits have natural latex, I think, and it, I don't know. they hold up much think, better, those I big bladders. That, correct. We don't see any It is literally, it is literally yeah, a, a plastic bag <laughs> that you then take that and you twist it, and then there's a, you take a rubber band and you knot that around, and that is your, I mean, you are just taking, it, this is your bladder. This is your, your you know, suit integrity. It's amazing. And, and there's a special way to tie the rubber band and, you know, a bunch of people who really know how to do it all, you know, teach us so that we can do it. And then we proudly show them we know how to do that. That's amazing. Yeah. Does, does this net ring, will this neck ring fit the other Apollo helmets? Or did they remain fairly consistent? They are consistent, the but there's little, little fidgety things about them. So we don't try to get sure. helmets mm -hmm. onto the suit. So, you same know, mechanism. Yeah, same it's mechanism. Still show, right? And uh, the blue was for training. The red would have been for flight. We don't have a flight oh, neck oh, ring on interesting. this. Okay. If you're looking at any of the flight suits, they always have a red. Yeah. Um, and then these different anodized uh, aluminums were anodized in different colors for different manufacturers and then also different parts that they were making. Uh, red is always on the right, so I call it red right. We always have blue on the left. Um, of Same the thing for ships and boats and yeah. navigating red right returning. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and then this this little shadowing here is because there's a lot of ad adhesives in this mm -hmm. suit. Um, I was which is, wondering about that. Um, you know, one of my greatest conservation challenges is unlike most every other object in our collection, we can't take them apart right. to conserve them. We just can't undo all of that adhes adhesive, uh, the mechanical fascinating and all the lacing and and in the historic suit, you would never want to because those, the way it was configured when we got it, like say Neil Armstrong's space suit is how he wore it. I would never get it back the same way. And that's part of the history and story of that suit. I would never want to undo it. So we do use imagery, x-rays and CT scanning to look inside our suits now to sort of study and monitor the condition of the materials. Um, but all of these once clear PVC adhesives that they used mm -hmm. on the suit have all yellowed. over have just yeah. yellowed because they're shadows. It's just where they would have, you know, wiped them on with a brush and, and done their work. But, you know, despite, despite the discoloration there as a polymer chemist, I'm just saying I'm very proud of the part <laughs> we have been playing in exploration. OK, except for also, you know, when all the little afgassing tacky things like polymers are really long chains. Right. Yeah. And everybody goes, oh, they're long chains. But when you make them, it's always a mixture of small little chains and long chains. And it is the small chains crawling out that makes old plastics feel tacky. Really? Because they are they're really low molecular weight and so they're and they that's why they're tacky. Sticky. Yep. Or they have chain scission and they get if they break yes. because we mechanically stress things that we don't mean to and that's one of the biggest mm -hmm. detriments to plastics I I think is actually mechanical stress because yes. then it starts to release call it stress induced right. crystallization you line when you do that it lines up all the little speak chains to my, speak to my love of <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to be sharing with people for so many years about why our rubber is deteriorating and then once it reaches correct me if I'm wrong the final crystallization stage I mean there's no more flexing allowed so when we started getting into the research on the suits and I would work with ILC and different people who made them, even the people who produced the rubber, um, you know, I tried to explain that because it's a museum object now and it's been around for 50 years. It's almost reached its end life of that crystallinity. So we can't get them flexible by warming them up or, or trying to put them in. There's no reversing that process. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just slowing it down and, and hoping it doesn't get worse and trying to support it the best we can. Exactly. No, I think you're right. So this, this guy, was in here for conservation to go out on display? So we are renovating the museum, right. as you've seen, yeah. and um, this will be in the Destination Mean exhibit, opening to the public this fall. Um, and it is one of three suits that we're gonna have in a, in a display where we talk about the evolution of the Apollo suit. Uh, we even have a sewing machine in that same display that 
came from the, ILC. The Big Bertha. Which, the... Uh, which they sewed the suits on, oh, um, which is great to show the public and our visitors sort of, um, you know, what it took. I mean, these are engineering, you know, really we call them like walking spacecraft. Yes. Um, people see a spacesuit and they think it's a garment, but... It's a, it's a spaceship in the form of a human. Right. right. <laughs> and you can do everything you would need to do in your spacesuit if you weren't in the command module. So um, we have three suits in that display and they're going to be really spectacular. Uh, we have an A1C, uh, which was generated out of the Apollo 1 program and then later abandoned uh, that design. And then we have a prototype that started with ILC and Hamilton Sunstrand uh, working on that suit to be able to walk on the lunar surface. And then the A5L, which leads up to uh, the A7L, and then we'll have Neil Armstrong's spacesuit in its own special case, which you've seen before, Yeah. Um, right next to the command module uh, in the same gallery. Oh, that's amazing. So it will be really fun, I think, for people. Yeah, I was looking at your archives the other uh, last night in preparation for this, and I saw the other two A5Ls that you have in the collection, and there, there's a lot of differences between all three of them. Yeah, I think they went through several... Uh, you know, you would have had several design prototypes mm -hmm. to showcase and try different things with and, and test. So Lisa, now that we're going back to the moon, the first woman, first wo person of color going back, do people come back to learn from these suits? They do. And it's interesting because unfortunately, a lot of the engineers, so we, during the Apollo 50th uh, anniversary in 2019, we had the original engineer crew that's left and the seamstresses come from ILC to see Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. Amazing. It was, it gave me chills. It's giving me chills now. I mean, it yeah. gave me chills to like, oh yeah, I put that button on. Oh, there's really? the glove I sewed. I was like, these are in a museum now. You know, yeah. these women are phenomenal. And um, they are going to, they do come back. The newer engineers have not seen the historic suit. So it's really important that we do preserve them and they do come back. Right. Um, we had the Orion crew to look at the heat shield on the Columbia when it was here because they were mm -hmm. replicating sort of similar materials and mm -hmm. designs for the heat shield for that. So they really do serve that purpose. People come back to the shuttle all the time to look at different aspects of that from NASA. I mean, it's part of what we agree to do by collecting these items in our uh, national collection. Do you see efforts to be making suits that would work for a range of sizes of people? Um, I, I do. There's different ones out there. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, what, what would be your first place to start when you think about a human being inside this suit, you know, making it so that people sort of literally just, I mean, even though it looks like it's my size, by the time you put the outer part on here, you know, basically the, the outsides are going to be here. So I'm not going to have this full motion of my, of my arms. You know, I'm going to be like this, you know, I, with the largest right, crotch right. pad ever used in the EVA suit. I mean, this I is a proud. personal question, right? Because right. this is not my area of expertise, but I mean, I would think the from the hips to your upper upper chest, mm -hmm. the women are different. I mean, we're going to have different mobility, uh, different uses for our hips, our pelvic regions are oh, different. Interesting. I would think. Good point. Um, so whole just from childbearing and all this comedy. sort of things we go through, yeah. and then you know, of course, your chest um, area is just functions differently. I think our mechanics of our inner organs are different. So I mean, we see that with just physical exercise and different abilities that I think people have. Right. Um, and how different people are. So I've only been thinking of the spacewalking suit, which we don't really walk in, right? right? But a lunar suit is going to need that mobility. Yeah, yeah, I don't think the mechanics of carrying weight and things would be different because mm -hmm. there's very strong women. Um, but we know definitely. can do a yeah. definite um, damage out there. So, <laughs> Well, and I think just keeping people involved, a whole range of people involved in the development, not just the idea and the brainstorming, but all the way through the design until it's, be, you know, an operational spacesuit so that along the way you figure out things that are unexpected that don't work or things that are great that should be applied even earlier. Well, then that's what's so great about the Smithsonian. Is that, I mean, NASA gave the suit to the Smithsonian a long the, time ago. In the, yeah, in the, in the 70s, 70s, we acquired most of the mission Suits and I, from the 60s when all the programs had had been completed. So, And I uh, think that they understood that later on they'd want to come back and look at this stuff. Yeah, and the developmental and prototype suits are the ones that people know the least about. So yeah. I get the most excited about working on because, um, you know, we see a lot of the mission suits come and go from display or mm -hmm. loans and things because yeah. those are the ones people are most familiar with. Um, but I'd like to hear your answer. So wearing a spacesuit, what do you think your your biggest challenge was wearing. I mean, we, I know you said not for walking, but you know, you had right. to have felt some sort of pressure or uncomfortable. I mean, they have to be practical in terms of 
you know, we had small, medium, large, extra large, and at a certain point, there just wasn't enough resources to support the small. And it affected, you know, more than a third of the women and, and some other guys, right? And, and so without that size, it, it's really just about a size that's missing. And so, like even something where like for your safety, it's your D-rings where you attach your actual leash to the space station or whatever. You can't really, you can't really get down there and really go, oh, I want to move it this way or this way. Sort of, the, there'll just be maybe one way that you can reach that or the fact that you have sort of short arms, you know, being able to really succumb. I mean, I would, I would basically be purple, you know, in these places wow. when you get out of the suit, just because, I mean, it's not whining, but it's just, right, yeah. you know, um, because you're hitting basically the shell. And right. so the newer suits, they're looking, they're basically cut narrower yeah. so that then you're not, you get, you, re, you retain that mobility. I okay. notice yep. those bearing, shoulder bearings are moving ever, ever inward to create a smaller right. profile here. But I think too, now that they're working with more people, I mean, you can be the same height, but a very different torso and leg size. Right. And so, and that's a big, that's a big thing really right there is that's why I had such a big pad was to be able to have my chin at least on the edge of the neck ring, right? <laughs> you know the U.S. military spent millions and millions of dollars trying to figure out what an average human was only to, to conclude that that was not a thing. It's, it is, it's so hard. There is you no know? such and thing. And gloves. I mean, and that's another Yeah, we haven't place. brought that up, but I was going to say that's yeah. very personal. Yep. And, and, you know, how to make them. And actually an example, you know, for me and not personally, but they pick some representative size and they're like, we're going to have small people. We'll pick her hands because she's been being assigned. So you're the small? I was the small. Yeah. I mean, it, well, just a, a, they wanted a, a pair of gloves in the small range. And when they made them, I mean, you spend a little while with your hands in jello and making making a mold. Right. And they use the same seam allowances as they do for all the rest of the gloves, which means, you know, some eighth of an inch or whatever it is. Right. But it's a bigger percentage of the full amount of the fabric. And the first pair of gloves that came out were basically too short for my fingers and, and too skinny. You know, and it wasn't that my hands changed. It's just that they used different seam allowances that were... You know, wow. so there's a lot of things yeah. to learn. Yeah. And you well, do everything with your hands. That has to exactly. be Exactly. Well, and, and really actually works. the width of the palm is a big thing because right. to find out that you're not doing this, but you're actually pushing this is a big, I mean, that makes it a lot harder to do. If the, if the palm is this wide, you have to push the whole, wow. you're squishing the whole palm instead of rotating. Because right it's there. under pressure. Exactly. But I wondered, um, I mean, for everybody, um, breaking in gloves is a thing. Like before I see a new pair of gloves, somebody has been at ILC Dover right, and they that. have been doing this. It's really painful. It's I hard. tried it. It is you? really difficult. They do like 90,000 reps on every exactly. single really? place you're going to use your gloves. And, and I, I got them. to like 10 and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I was like, hey, I will come down there. I will live down there. I will sleep on the cot. I will do my gloves, you know, just, you know, that'd be great. But do we do that for the spacesuit? Do we do break-ins? They do. And so for Neil Armstrong's uh, suit, one of the interesting things we learned about when we were working on it here um, was he, some of those earlier suits, and I believe it was his as well, they went in their training suit because they had been using it. Mm -hmm. And up to like a month before, they changed out parts. I mean, you look at the discrepancy log that they keep for everything you guys do uh, in your suits. And we were lucky enough to get that documentation for his suit. We don't have it for everyone's. Um, and they changed out the zipper like two months before. They he would fly back and forth for the suit would fly back and forth from Delaware to Houston and they would come and, you know, try it on and go through more testing. And um, then I think they just wanted to use the one that they had changed and were most familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. So, yeah, sometimes the training and backup suits we have. So every astronaut early on had three suits personalized to mm -hmm. them. Um, they're in much better condition than obviously the flight suits, but sure. not with all that storytelling on there, like the lunar dust and everything that we <laughs> love. Um, but yes, they did test in their suits. It's That's a really amazing. exciting time for spacesuits, I think, because we we do have a larger range of people that are flying, and people are determined to make this work, and and so the you know the value of being able to come here, see this suit, get some ideas. You know, they've got ideas of what they think needs to change, but maybe not how to do it. And they'll find some of them here. They'll find some of them in your workshop, which is a scary but amazing place. <laughs> Well, I mean, and what you're bringing up is that we think culturally, we've seen spacesuits for so many decades that many people just think of the spacesuit as a solved engineering problem. No way. And what you bring up is that it's so far from a solved problem. And yet, I think we all agree it's a solvable problem. Right. It's just the iteration that's happening right. right now. And a lot of it's behind the scenes. I don't know what Blue Origin suit looks like. I wish I did. But all these different folks are working on suits. 
Exactly. And I think it's going to bring some really interesting well, and, and I wish, you know, it would be together. You know, in the, right. first of all, I mean, who no is going to say, yeah. no, I don't think I'll go to space because the suit doesn't quite fit me. Could I, you know, or nobody's going like to say that. It looks. <laughs> and so really people are just going to make it work. Right. right? Yeah. And, and it delays that solution, those solutions, because people don't want to say, yeah, I'll wait to go to space. Oh, interesting. You're right. And that's why, I mean, I, and I see that now maybe happening at all these different companies where it might not, this might not be optimal or this might not be optimal. And if we would just go, the, the goal is spacesuit technology for the planet. Yeah. That would get us further. Because Alan Eustace worked on his suit when he designed it with ILC and Secret before the stratosphere jump. Yeah. Um, that was the most interesting thing I heard when we were, we mounted that suit. It's actually in a display downstairs, um, which is pretty funny because I usually am pretty um, not okay hanging or, or doing dynamic displays and make suits look like props because that's not what we want to do. And right. most of our historic suits are too fragile for that. But because his came in new after his flight, and we worked with him, we were able to suspend it from his balloon apparatus. Um, and, you know, he worked pretty closely with them, yeah. you know, on everything, which, you know, I think is a is a great, great, great way to do it. Every time I go through the galleries, I'm going to hear Lisa's voice in the back of my head. I'll see like you know, somebody was going, no, not like that. That would stress <laughs> that. Or that wouldn't really help the suit speak, right? Yeah, I mean, visual interpretation is very key because we want the public I mean, obviously, to see them as fragile artifacts, first of all, and that we are preserving them. But by allowing them to be displayed, that sort of counterbalances that whole piece of preservation uh, for us. Because, you know, as conservators, you'd want to lock everything away in a dark climate controlled <laughs> sure. vault, but that's not how it's going to be. And it's the dark side. They're not here for that. Um, exactly. And <laughs> I just, um, you know, I just. I, you know, building mannequins has been like sort of 22 years now of my like trying to change them to get them to be more dynamic. And one of the things we used to do was immediately we had the helmets and gloves on and then we noticed with the changes in materials, they were locking up. Mm -hmm. They were also creating a micro environment where the suit was continuing to off gas, as we've seen. And then it was like feeding. There was no ventilation oh, within the suit. Yeah, so, definitely cycle. not. Right. Yep. Then we went through a period where we're like, all the suits, uh, helmets and gloves must be off for display. Well, the visitors don't really get to see what Neil Armstrong's spacesuit looked like on the lunar surface if you don't have the, the gold helmet yeah. and the EVA gloves and all that together. So we're designing mannequins now to increase ventilation. His suit actually has ventilation going through the mannequin system we designed. Mm -hmm. um, these won't um, because that's a research project we're still developing to see if that will work for many suits. But um, we're leaving the zipper open and the gloves are going to be magnetically attached. So Shepard's suit will also have the gloves and helmet on, oh, but nice. they're going to be magnetically attached to the mannequin system. So we leave a little bit of room. Mm -hmm. um, so they're in position, but they're not actually utilizing the disconnects and things that would, would set up that problem. That or if we need to remove them, those. if we see problems, we can get them off quite quickly. Nice. So we we're constantly working for a better, a better way to, you know, we love the public comments, but you know, how we can we get this to look better for the public and also stay and uh, conserve them and preserve them. It's beautiful. Lisa, that's, thank you. Every time I come here, I get to see another unbelievable object and- You have good timing. I really do. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, we have some new suits in the lab. It's almost like, you know what I'm doing. <laughs> Katie, I wish um, you could just put this on. I'm just waiting for Elisa to take a little break. <laughs> <laughs> I would never. <laughs> I think it's as good a place to wrap as any. Katie is not going to put on the suit, I promise. Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> I never get tired of visiting the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. I always find something new to lock onto, and the tail on display of human ingenuity is always inspiring. If you'd like to get a better sense of what it's like to stand in front of a space shuttle or visit the Spacesuit Conservation Lab, we also filmed this in virtual reality as part of the Tested VR series. You can watch this right now, either through the Tested VR app or on MetaQuest TV. Links and instructions are in the description below. Thanks, you guys, for watching.